Hi, this is The Philosophical Angle. I am your host, Chris Angle. The purpose of The Philosophical Angle is to define concepts in current media. I am the author of four books on philosophy, which can be seen at www.philosophypublishing.com. Along with me are my panelists, Rick Samuelson, who graduated from Yale, has an MBA from Wharton and an MA from Tufts. Rick is an independent investor and former investment banker. Also with me is Mark Brennan. Mark is a professor at the Stern School of Business at New York University. He's also the editor of the London Quarterly Review. Welcome, guys. Hello. The purpose of the philosophical angle is to examine the nature of concepts and topics being used in current media and compare its essence with usage and circumstances and how they are being used. This week, the concept that we'll discuss is the European debt crisis that is in the forefront of the news and whether it has an impact on the direction of the stock market for the rest of this coming year and perhaps even into 2013. So to begin the discussion, we're going to take uh, examine an article from the New York Times on May 30th. In, it's entitled, Europe Fears Bailout of Spain Would Strain Its Resources. It's, uh, this article is by Landon Thomas, Jr., and uh, it begins as, Spain's deepening financial problems make a European bailout a more distinct possibility. A looming question is where the money will come from. Spanish and European officials hope a bailout will not be needed, but each day financial turmoil mounts over the government takeover of the giant Spanish mortgage lender, Bankia. The flight of money to safer borders in a worsening recession. Compounding Spain's problems has been an outflow of foreign capital from the country. Later on in the article, it states in the bond market, the Spanish government's borrowing costs are approaching the symbolically dangerous level of 7% on the 10-year bonds. The rise has stoked worries that Spain might need bailouts similar in scope, though many times larger, than those extended to Greece, Portugal, and Ireland. In another article from the uh, New York Times by Nathaniel Popper, entitled Europe's fade becomes drag on sales for U.S. companies. So in one case, we have here, the article states that there's a debt crisis going on. Here in another article, it states that there's an influence of this debt coming to companies' profit sheets. It states, as the European crisis intensifies, a growing number of companies in the United States are warning investors that sales in the region are slowing and could get worse. In the technology industry, one of the most exposed to Europe and an engine of American recovery, Cisco, Dell, and NetApp have all recently pointed to unexpected weakness in European sales. Other areas with major exposure to the continent including automakers and industrial companies, are beginning to voice similar cautions. Often later on in the article, it says the economy of the European Union, which holds the 17 nations that use the euro currency and 10 others, is a larger economic unit than the United States or China. In the case of technology companies, analysts say they believe that about a third of all revenue comes from Europe. Later on, 
Prospects for the European economy darkened in recent days as surveys showed that manufacturing across the European zone contracted in May and the unemployment rate climbed to a record 11 percent. Manufacturing has also slowed in India and China. According to data released last week, threatening two of the most reliable drivers of global growth. In the United States, job creation slowed to the weakest level in a year. So is there a connection between this, this debt crisis of Greece and Portugal and Spain and possibly Italy? Is this influencing the worldwide beginnings of a recession? We're here to discuss that problem. And let's begin. Uh, guys, do you have any, uh, any opening remarks as to the, uh, uh, the correlation between this problem, these two problems? Mark, why don't we begin with you? Uh, can I defer to Mark? Oh, sure. OK, well, I, I mean, this is a cart and a horse issue, right? Uh, at a fundamental level, uh, demand in many large economies is slowing. Uh, the earnings cycle across a number of industries has peaked. We've seen uh, fairly large rises in a number of commodities prices, in other words, input costs uh, uh, in this cycle, this earnings cycle since the recovery in the stock market began in you know, 2009. So, uh, that the stock market should be peaking and uh, earnings downgrades should be forthcoming at this stage and at this time in you know a normal stock market cycle should not be a, a huge surprise. Now to what extent the obvious problems affecting uh, European banks for example uh, in terms of restricted lending on the back of their obvious risks with the large volumes of sovereign bonds they hold from various countries stricken with uh, uh, an overvalued currency. Uh, to, to what extent that plays into the lower demand levels and the lower investment levels and the lower growth levels in Europe is a little bit difficult to discern. What I read about Germany is, you know, unemployment is at multi-year lows. The economy, if it's uh, growing more slowly, is still growing faster than that in the United States, for example. And so, and, and wage growth has been held in check uh, over the last several years. So that sounds to me like uh, an economy that's been pretty well managed. If you look at the stricken countries like Spain and Italy and Greece and so forth, you, you find pretty much the opposite. Wages have been allowed to explode, entitlements have been allowed to explode, uh, uh, productivity growth has been weak, if, uh, if anything, and there's a huge overhang of uh, generally real estate related uh, bad debt that you know the banks are grappling with. So, you know, to, to me, it, it's, it's extremely important to dissociate the bad economic policies at a country-specific level from this, you know, sort of grab bag issue of, uh, you know, keeping the euro together. Uh, I, I just don't see the, the issues. The issue is twofold. One, we're at a logical point in the earnings cycle where you would expect the stock market to be leveling off and falling. And two, uh, individual countries within Europe have shown widely divergent skill in terms of how they manage themselves. Okay, good point, Mark. Uh, any comments? Yeah, we've said on earlier shows that the uh, sooner the euro break, the euro is going to break up. The happier world will all be, and I think Rick's comments are leading us again to that conclusion. But I've come, I've come to the conclusion that the single biggest 
proponent and supporter of this continued hero nightmare are the, is the army of bureaucrats in Brussels who will all be out of jobs when the euro goes down the toilet. These people make the likes of Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, and Lillard Romney look like productive citizens. So that's the kind of nonsense we're fighting. And until we can get those people out of the way and let these economies just revert to some kind of normal basis, you're going to keep reading every single day on the cover of the Wall Street Journal. It'll be Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal, our own unit. Going to leave the Eurozone, going to collapse. Uh, and, and will that all happen? You know, that's one of our biggest export markets. The U.S. economy is just going to continue to pound sand. So, again, you know, we're, we're a bellicose nation, and if we're going to be bellicose, are they going to my advantage? So I say let's attack the bureaucrats that are running the euro. Okay, so actually uh, I think you uh, began with the uh, statement that it actually would be a good thing to if, if, the, if the, they went back from the euro to the individual currencies of their uh, countries, respective countries. Is that, did, did, I, uh, did I hear that correctly, Mark? Yeah, well, last, last week, I think, or two weeks ago, we said, Let, let's just let Greece go, let's get to the uh, That would be a better solution. But I can't believe that a lot of these countries, especially Greece, if you were Greek, why do you leave any of your money in the bank? You're going to wake up one morning and your euros in the bank are going to be dropped when they're going to be worth nothing. Why has there not been a Greek bank run? I believe there have been, uh, that that has already started. Uh, you know, not to, the term, not to the extent where they collapse and the, literally the buildings fall down. I mean, I don't know why anyone would keep even a penny in a Greek bank. Rick, any comment on that? Well, I'm obviously sympathetic. To, uh, look, the, the, in a sense, it, the economic damage has been done. What's the unemployment rate in, in, in Spain and these various other countries? I mean, it's high double digit, especially amongst young people. So the question is, how do we get the market to adjust? How do we put Spain and Greece and Italy and these other countries in a position where they are competitive and they can provide the world or Europe or any, anyone else with something that the world wants to buy? And how do we do that as quickly and in as orderly a way as possible? Well, one way to do it is to have them devalue and um, revert back to their own separate currencies. That is one way to make that adjustment. Um, it doesn't do anyone any good to kind of pretend that Greece is going to turn into Germany overnight or, or Spain is going to do the same or that somehow the bad real estate loans are going to come good again despite all the overbuilding in some of these locations. I mean, all we're doing now in Europe, I'm speaking of Europe specifically, is putting off the, or attempting to put off the day of reckoning and hoping that somehow the Germans should be able to pay for all this foolishness. And if, if I were German, you know, I, I think I'd probably balk uh, just the way, uh, you know, someone living in Washington might balk at having to pay off bad uh, state debt from uh, California. Well, I believe right? that, uh, I believe they are balking, uh, and that's why um, uh, they haven't come to any overall conclusion. I, I believe that the... Uh, hey, Chris, uh, I, I think a better analogy would be uh, how Americans might balk at paying off Mexican debt. I don't want to pay off California debt, California debt, but imagine if we had to pay off Mexican debt or Guatemalan debt. I mean, that's, that's, that's the kind of calculation the Germans are doing. They have, they have no affinity for Greeks. But I'd also like to make one, uh, a quick preemptive apology to the FCC, because Rick used a four-letter word in his last diatribe, and that four-letter word was market, something that has never been, you know, talked about or discussed in any of these, in any of these in any conversations that the politicians are having. They want to avoid any kind of market force. They want to prop up this garbage as long as they can with every anti-market force that only kicks the can down the road and makes the problem even bigger at the end of the day. You know, history doesn't, history, uh, the world doesn't follow patterns and history doesn't tell us what's going to happen. But it's interesting to look back and look at what happened last time there was a big currency collapse in Europe. 50 million people died. Did you say 50 million people died? Yeah. 
And when was that? It was called World War II. Oh, okay. I, okay. And um, so I'm, I'm going to make here a little wrap-up of uh, not necessarily a conclusion to the program, but a, a summary of, uh, of what we talked about and uh, a possible uh, uh, connection between the, uh, the overspending of European governments and the recessions, the recessions that are, uh, one, the recession that's happening uh, in Europe uh, presently, uh, and one that may have a great influence on the U.S. economy and thus on the direction of the stock market for the, uh, for the coming six, eight, ten months, which I think is definitely on a downward, uh, uh, will, will uh, continue on a downward trend. Um, and so let's, let's go to, uh, to some notes here uh, that we've made, some visual notes. And so we know that in Europe, they can't pay their bills. Greece, the Greek debt crisis is, is obviously uh, full-blown. They can't pay their bills. Uh, they must go to some sort of austerity or get uh, money from the, uh, the northern uh, uh, countries that uh, we've already discussed, such as Germany. And this is actually developing into something a little bit larger, into the threat of, uh, of what the, uh, the so-called pigs, Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain. Um, and this, so this, this debt crisis is, uh, seems to be mushrooming and developing uh, uh, overall uh, strength uh, and, will, and therefore will have a, an overall influence on the... Uh, 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 on who can pay their bills. And when a European uh, uh, country can't pay its bills, it means that there is less money to be paid to the receivers and thus they'll have mo less money to spend. Of course, governments are inefficient by themselves. But nevertheless, a system is in place where uh, that now has to be altered and thus people are not going to be paid as much as previously, as they previously thought because the government can't pay its bills and loans. So, a slowdown is in the offing. And in fact, it's really not in the offing. It's here in, in uh, Europe already. We've seen from these articles that we, uh, from the New York Times, it's already happening. So, let's, now let's go to the, the, take out that inefficiency, the coming debt, there's a, the, we've got that coming debt crisis. Governments try to reorganize. In other words, they're going to have an austerity program. They're going to, their budgets are going to be slashed because they can't pay for it. So they have no choice if they're not, if somebody doesn't come to their rescue. And it doesn't seem like they're going to. As Mark mentioned, who wants to pay the debts of another? There'd be a major revolution if Americans had to suddenly decide that uh, uh, they had to pay the, uh, the debts of, uh, of, a, uh, of some uh, country from South America. But, and, and so that's uh, uh, happening in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. So there's an austerity and less payments. Therefore, there's going to be a recession, as, we've, as the article indicates. But I think it'll be a short-term recession because with, the re with that recession and the less payments, government becomes less of a driver of the economy. It'll go from government to private enterprise more so than previously. Thus, an efficiency will come back into the economy and thus will be able to, Europe will see a revival. Now, the timeline on that, who knows? I'm going to, it'll be at least until 2013 for the recession as it is to run its course and for the, re, uh, the, the, the coming efficiencies to reintroduce themselves into the future economies of Europe and to the United States because we have our own debt crisis 
And let's take a little uh, look at that. Our debt crisis here is expanding. So in an article on the uh, Review and Outlook page of today, June 6th, entitled Obama's Debt Boom, the Most Predictable Crisis in History. I will, uh, let me read a couple of paragraphs from this. The CBO's long-term budget outlook notes that federal debt held by the public, the kind we have to pay back, will surge to 70% of the economy by the end of this year. That's the highest share of GDP in U.S. history except World War II, higher than during the Civil War or World War I. It's also way up from 40% in 2008 and from the 40-year average of 38 percent. And it's fast rising. CBO says that on present trend, the national debt will hit 90 percent of GDP by 2022. It then balloons to, two, to 109 percent by 2026, and that would be the all-time World War II peak and approaches almost 200 percent of the GDP by 2037. So the crisis, the debt crisis exists on both sides of the Atlantic. So in, uh, but looking forward, we're going to have an immediate recession in Europe, and that will be affected because companies here have a tremendous, in, are tremendously influenced by their balance sheets by our largest market, which is the European market. Guys, any uh, reaction to this little summary? Rick? Well, yeah, I read that article too. Um, some of these trends are now so well ensconced that, you know, just bending the arc of uh, debt growth is going to be take, take a huge amount of political will uh, for the next administration. Uh, so, you know, we're we're, we're now comparing. Who's worse? Uh, is it the European countries or the United States in terms of the debt they're piling on? I, I mean, it's it's a uh, it, it's a sad contest. Uh, I would submit that uh, the recovery could be quicker for Europe if they got some of these countries off of the euro in an orderly fashion. Right? That would allow the adjustment to occur faster. In, in the case of the United States, draconian cuts across the board are what is required uh, We lost Rick temporarily, but I hope he'll come back here. Mark, uh, we'll have to uh, we'll, we'll jump to you here. Okay, the only thing I would disagree with what you said, Chris, when you first started talking about we can't, uh, you know, Europe can't pay its debt. It's got to go into austerity. I thought you were talking about the United States, and then you nicely wove it back to the United States. The only thing I disagree with you on is you mentioned the idea that the United, there would be a revolt in the United States if we had to pay the debts of some South American country. Chris, I don't think there's anything that could cause a revolt in this country because the people are so complacent that they're willing to go to an airport and be groped by, uh, you know, some funny looking guy in a silly looking suit. So Americans don't protest the way they used to. The ones who do are, can, you know, all dissent is pathologized. Occupy Wall Street is considered weirdos. The Tea Party is giving uh, these fake protests where they're claiming we want smaller government at the same time that they're demanding that their their their, their welfare in turn in, in in the form of Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security not be touched. So we are no longer a revolutionary people. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna take what we're about to get, and we're gonna we're gonna get it good and hard. Okay. Um, you know, that's uh, uh, one more thing. So uh, what do you think of the uh, outlook of the stock market for the coming six months to a year, Mark? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not conversant on the stock market's valuation at present. So if you can tell me the valuation, I, I can give you an opinion on it. I, I, know, I know what I think the economy is going to do. I don't, I don't know what the market is priced right now. Okay, we'll take, uh, we'll take the economy. What do you think that'll do? Uh, I see nothing exciting happening. You know, uh, 
which way it can rates go, pretty much they can only go up, which will stifle economic growth. Uh, uh, rates, you mean uh, interest you know, rates you're talking about, b uh, bond interest rates? Yeah, rates, you know, rates can pretty much only go one direction at this point, although they just keep going down. And when the rate bubble pops, it's going to make the housing bubble look like a walk in the park. So I don't see it. There's nothing in the economy that's getting me excited, despite all of the, uh, you know, all the Pollyannas and all the Wall Street firms who are paid to write uplifting pieces. Uh, there's nothing out there that's getting me excited. Right. And you think the uh, influence from the uh, recession that seems to be uh, taking hold in Europe, do you think that is going to soon have an influence here in the United States on, on our economy? Sure, that's good. One of our biggest export markets is going to kill exports, uh, you know, and we've got this enormous debt overhang that we refuse to talk about. It's the elephant in the room and we're all ignoring it. And one day we're not going to be able to ignore it and one day it's going to be a huge problem. And it's going to be really ugly and we're all going to, you know, we're all going to run around saying, well, why didn't we do anything? I'll tell you why we didn't do anything. Because we were all too busy watching American Idol and eating ourselves into diabetic comas and bombing foreign countries. That's why we don't care about the debt. Well, agreed, and uh, Rick is back with us, so um, uh, Rick, do you have any, we would just ask Mark about um, the, um, uh, what he views uh, to be the uh, direction of the economy in the next six months to a year. Do you have any final uh, uh, statement as to uh, the economy over the, uh, that time period? Well, I think there's, there's a, a fairly large likelihood that we're going to uh, re-enter recession, if we haven't already. Uh, but this is not surprising at this stage in the economic cycle. So, you know, all the hand waving about the euro and, you know, that's causing volatility. Yeah, there may be something to that, but it, 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 it's this is daily news related stuff. The fundamentals affecting overall demand in the various world economies and the earnings cycle are, are part and parcel of what you might expect at this stage in the uh, the business cycle. Okay. Well, I would like to uh, thank my guests on the, uh, for joining us today. And uh, in summary, I think that we've pretty much agreed that uh, we expect the economy of, uh, uh, of Europe to have an effect on the U.S. economy in the coming year, uh, and it may be detrimental. And I am certainly of that opinion. And with that, uh, the Philosophical Angle signs off, and see you next time. Thank you.